Welcome into this week's edition of AWA Unleashed. We are the preeminent, the self-proclaimed preeminent podcast and uh, video stream. We are dedicated to the AWA, the American Wrestling Association. I am Chris Tubbs. I am one. Uh, I am just one small part of this. Let's bring in uh, George Shire and Mick Karch. And guys, I know that last week we covered the uh, we covered the heels. This week we're going to cover the baby faces. We're going to get into that, uh, but I know that before we get into anything else, this is kind of a it's it's a special week and it's kind of a, a special week in kind of a bittersweet way, Nick. Yeah, it was, and I find this hard to believe. It's 29 years this week that uh, my good friend, the old Minneapolis promoter Wally Carbo, passed away, and you know the the fact that it's three decades is just mind blowing. Uh, there's Wally and I on the set of Saturday Night at Ringside. Um, Wally was a character he, uh, to a fault, but I'll tell you something. He mentored me, and when I was trying to get in with the AWA and it was an uphill battle, Wally was the guy that went to bat for me, and uh, I, I dearly miss him. And I, when he passed away, he passed away two weeks short of when I was going to give him a Lifetime Achievement Award at a show in uh, Minneapolis. So never got the opportunity to do that, but uh, I, I am eternally grateful to Wally Carbo. Uh, one hell of a guy, great friend, and again, I can't believe it's 29 years. That's that's just insane. Yeah, there would be no AWA. There would be no... Uh, n- n- none of this would be possible if it wasn't for Wally Carbo. I mean, is that... Fair to say, George. I, I, I agree. Absolutely. You know, if, you know, you can say Vern, but I'm telling you, Wally was the guy. He was the uh, he was the one that stirred the drink. And so I miss him. I thought it was interesting. Uh, we had talked about this briefly before we went on the air that uh, it was raining the day that Wally died at his funeral. And um, I remember the wrestlers would call him up with a problem, try to get something through and Wally told Bobby Heenan one time, he said, I can't talk with you right now. It's raining in Miami. And he hung up. And that would be Wally, that would be Wally Carbo. It's the way he was. It had nothing to do with anything. Absolutely not. He wanted to get off the phone. And you know, we saw him bumbling and stumbling through sentences on the air when he'd come out and play the promoter with the fines and the suspensions. But the reality of it was is that he was actually the brains of the whole outfit. Mm -hmm. Yep. Made it made everything go. Great guy. And it was a sad day. 29 years. I told Mick I it, it only feels like 28. <laughs> That's I, I'm glad that you were able to to um to bring that up and you guys were able to say something yeah. because I, I do think that, you know, again, for somebody like me who a lot of this I'm just kind of finding out uh, you know along the way. I think it's good to to you know kind of go back and, and kind of get to feel and really how you guys felt about him as well, because ultimately that's a big part of why this podcast is what it is. This video is what it is, is you guys sharing your experiences with everybody. So um, I do appreciate that. Let's get into the, uh, the trivia question. We got a trivia winner from uh, last week, Nick. So uh, why don't you go ahead and give that to us? We do. The trivia winner is Jeremy Chura. Uh, Jeremy from Fargo, North Dakota. The question. Ah, yes. The Red yeah, River Valley true. shout out. I can't, I can't say much more because I, you know, apparently I was not supposed to say NDSU or Moorhead for uh, apparently somebody didn't, my conversation about the women in the Red River Valley. But I mean, I, but I, I, I digress. Yes. He, well, I, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope it clears up. But at any rate, wow. Jeremy Chura. Congratulations, Jeremy knew that the last two men that feuded with the late, great Adrian Adonis uh, before he left the AWA, it was his final run, and then sadly he passed in July of 1988. Uh, it was Tommy Rich and Greg Ganya. They were the two major feuds that uh, Adrian Adonis had mm-hmm. uh, prior to his leaving, and congratulations, Jeremy Chura. All right, and uh, what is what is he going to get? He's going to get something from something from you, Mick. Well, you know, I, I really like Jeremy Chura. He's a he's a great kid, so I may send him an autograph picture of you, Chris. Okay, all right. You know, and and that should effectively take him out of the play, and he won't watch this podcast anymore once I do that to him. Yeah. 
So I'd be careful, Mick. I don't think um, Chris can write in cursive, so <laughs> it'll, it'll look like it's just just teasing, just teasing. No, I sl I slur my writing. It's not cursive. I slur my writing. You guys don't know what's in my coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Someday I want to talk to you guys about autographs. We could have an episode on that too. You have an episode every time you open up your mouth. So Chris, can we can we uh, go ahead here? Yeah, we we, we might as well because we're probably going to be running heavy anyway. Uh, so we're about baby faces today. And before we we get into it, I kind of asked you guys last week what makes a good heel. I'm going to ask you guys this week what makes a good baby face. And uh, George, why don't you go ahead and start? I think what makes a good baby face is someone who doesn't have to try to make the fans like them. Although I did hear several wrestlers over the years say that to be a baby face, it's tougher than being a heel. And But a baby face is someone who the fans just naturally come to, are around, they want to see them, they want to cheer them. And we're going to talk about some in the AWA today that uh, – definitely personified what a baby face was. I think the emphasis should be on the word was because the baby faces of old, oh, yeah. uh, the old AWA days were baby faces. I mean, they got sympathy. Yeah. You're, you're Mike. <laughs> you got, uh, you got sympathy uh, when you were getting beat up nowadays if you're a baby face and you're getting the shit kicked out of you by some heel, the fans are, you know, applauding. They want to see you carted out on a stretcher. So uh, it it had to be somebody that, that the fans believed in, that they identified with, and had sympathy for. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. You guys have each given me a list of 10. And let's go ahead and start it off. Uh, George, kick it off with uh, one of them that, that uh, you thought was a pretty major baby face. Well, I think he was a major baby face for a major reason. This individual was never in his entire wrestling career a heel. Everywhere he went, whatever territory, he was cheered and he was beloved. And I am talking about Wilbur Snyder. Wilbur was the consummate baby face. He was such a baby face that when he would wrestle against a fellow baby face, Wilbur would be the one that would be the sentimental favorite. And that is true because when he wrestled Vern Gagne several times in the 50s, the fans actually cheered Wilbur a little bit over Vern. And I think that says everything. But he did, was did Vern did Vern was he okay with Wilbur being the more, you know, more of a sympathetic baby face in that then? Well, Vern and Wilbur were very close friends outside the ring. And Vern was, Wilbur was one of the few guys that Vern ever let actually pin him and win matches from him. So there was a, there was a respect there. But Wilbur got the cheers. No matter what, he never played the heel in wrestling. Mm -hmm. He just didn't. Always ver And always brought in as a major star, and he was over. Mm -hmm. Always yeah. got the sympathy. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Mick, what do you got for your first one? Well, George mentioned him, and I think it's an obvious choice. Uh, Vern Gagne, uh, especially here in the state of Minnesota, you talk about a baby face for so many years, right from the 1950s, you know, AWA, before the AWA started, when it was still NWA territory. And throughout the years, uh, Vern was the guy. And I, I a lot can be said about Vern, you know, behind the scenes, you know, some people loved him, some people didn't, but I don't think there was a guy with more charisma. He was Minnesota and Minnesota wrestling, and he hobnobbed with the Hubert Humphreys and the John Kennedys, and Vern was the real deal. He was an all-around celebrity, and anytime you mention professional wrestling in the AWA and the state of Minnesota, Vern Gagne is the guy. Yeah, no, no question about it. that. That's the first name that comes to mind with me because we mentioned Wally at the beginning of the show. But I mean, for the casual fan like me, when I first learned, it's like, yeah, it, it was all about, you know, Vern Gagne. Uh, Georgia, what did you got for number two? Number two is a guy who was a baby face, <clears throat> but he was equally 
a heel. It depended on the territory. But in the AWA, Cowboy Bill Watts was the epitome of the late 60s babyface. White hat, cowboy, very popular. In fact, a popularity poll that was conducted by the Wrestling News magazine, Bill Watts was named the most popular AWA wrestler. He's holding his plaque there for that award. But the truth of the matter was, is that he did get more votes than even the Crusher. I will add that the only reason that was is that the Crusher was on one of his little vacations at the time and the fans' memories went a little blank. But Bill Watts was the popular wrestler over anybody during that time period. And when he wrestled Vern in his series of title matches, they cheered Watts over Vern in the sense that Vern was the subtle heel just by the fact that he would slap Cowboy or do something like that, and the fans would rally behind Cowboy Bill Watts. So very, very popular. But in other territories, he could be a heel. His famous Saturday evening post with a uh, breakup with Bruno San Martino, where he was the heel. Yeah, I, that's that's what I remember. I don't ever remember, you know, hearing the Bill Watts being a, a, a baby face here. All I remember is, you know, being a, a heel in other territories. Uh, Mick, what do you got next? Number two, the consummate wrestler. Uh, and this guy, when he came into the AWA, he came in with some fanfare because he defeated Blackjack Lanza and Kobayashi on television. I've talked about his series of matches with Nick Bockwinkle, the greatest as far as I'm concerned in the AWA. I'm talking about Billy Robinson, master technician uh, to a man. You talk about guys in the business who, who have been stretched by Billy Robinson uh, he was the real deal. He was no nonsense. He defended the wrestling business to a fault. If you dared to question the authenticity of professional wrestling, uh, you paid for it. If you were a smart-ass rookie trying to get uh, the best of Billy Robinson, you paid for it. Later on in his career, they teamed up with Lord Alfred Hayes. He became a heel. But the babyface years of Billy Robinson for so, you know, so consistently in the AWA, uh, they don't they don't make him any better. Billy Robinson was the real deal. Where would you put him in terms of maybe just pure wrestlers? All time, like pure amateur could go and, and what they call a shoot. Where would you guys put him in terms of like, you know, would he be top three, top five? Top five for sure. I mean, you know, if, if not top three, you know, they talk about Vern Gagne, they talk about Luthez and Danny Hodge, but Billy Robinson is right up there. He was a shooter, and uh, even well into his uh, later years, he was still training wrestlers, a no-nonsense guy. And, uh, oh, yeah, top five for sure. I, I would say that uh, Billy's probably right in there with Thez. I'd throw Jack Briscoe in there and uh, definitely Hodge. Yeah. I mean, he's up there in the top three or four, absolutely. Okay. I was just I, I was just curious because I mean that's it really seemed like Vern valued wrestling and and you know amateur wrestling abilities so I was just kind of curious like where he would have fallen in that spectrum. Uh, what do you got for your next one here, George? The next guy I come up with is a guy named Billy Red Lions. Billy was so over in the AWA for his uh, two and a half year run here. Part of it was because he was brought in and immediately thrust into the main events uh, with. A guy nobody could beat and nobody had beaten, and that was Dr. X. But Billy came in, beat Doc with his figure four leg lock, his own hold, and just became absolutely one of the most popular wrestlers for the next year and a half, and then in a great tag team too. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. But he ranks up there with the best of the AWA. All right, what do you got for your next one here, Mick? I think most wrestling fans would go with this one as the guy that they remember the most and idolize the most in the AWA and even over Vern Gagne, I would say. And that would be the man from Milwaukee, the crusher. And well, wait a minute, we got we got we got a flip flop there. Oh, wait a minute. Nope. Sorry. I'm gonna I hang on a minute. Wrong, I, cl I clicked the wrong one. Hang oh I know. Well, guess who number four is, ladies and gentlemen. Fines and suspensions, Tubbs. Did, did you find Crusher's picture yet? Can we go back to Crush? 
Hold on. <laughs> Jesus. Well, I'll talk about them anyway. Uh, the uh, the, uh, the crutch, ladies and gentlemen. There he there is. There it is. There it is. God, I make the one proper, mistake. One mistake in like two months. And I'm like, ah, ah, ah. well, no, the first mistake was hiring us, but talk about the crutch. Oh, you're not getting paid. Those checks, uh, don't cash those checks for like, you know, three weeks. I know. Bounce it over to me. Crusher was without a doubt the hero from 1965. And I'm telling you, the next 20, 21 years on and off, he was the wrestler that made Milwaukee famous. He was the guy with the 100 megaton arms. And anytime there was a heel, a bad guy running roughshod in the AWA, eventually they had to deal with the Crusher. And, of course, he's a former AWA heavyweight champion, former tag team champion on a couple of occasions. Um, Crusher was one of the funniest, most spontaneous promo guys that ever lived. And uh, I've mentioned before, uh, away from the ring, quiet family man. You would never expect this guy to be the Crusher. But I, I think in the history of the AWA, this is the guy. This is the baby face of all time in the AWA. And when you look at the Crusher, attendance wise, it is a fact that when Crusher would be gone for a month or two or three, AWA attendance overall dropped. And that always was a, a sore spot with Vern because he'd have to call up the Crusher and not that he had an issue doing it, it's that, but he'd have to call up the Crusher and get him out of his, his uh, self-imposed retirement and bring him back and he'd get a pop. And as popular as Vern was and got a pop when he was on the card, mm -hmm. Crusher was the man for attendance. Is there anybody else that could have done that? Or did Vern just know that every time that he would bring back Crusher, he was guaranteed to, to get that guaranteed. Kind of pop? Guaranteed. Guaranteed. And Mick, I think you would agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Crusher was magic. It was an automatic box office bonanza. Yep. You, you'd have him come in as a surprise opponent for some roughshod uh, bully in the territory mm -hmm. that has been, you know, wrecking havoc and they bring the crusher back and pow attendance yep. to be up and they could have their program for six or eight months and, and it never it never got old did, did fans no. just get to the point where they they'd expect crusher and they were like waiting for him then it never got old but sadly crusher did crusher did and and it was kind of a like a dramatic drop all of a sudden uh, he was still you know going strong in the 1980s in his feud with jerry blackwell but Noticeably, Crusher had slowed down a lot when he teamed up the, with the Baron. Baron Von Raschke won the AWA Tag Team title. The fans at that point weren't buying it. Uh, the Road Warriors were even getting cheered over the Crusher and the Baron. So Crusher might have outstayed his welcome a little bit, but uh, during his heyday, number one, absolutely. I would point out that with the Road Warriors, though, that that was a new breed of fans yeah. that didn't remember the Crusher mm -hmm. from 10, yeah. 15, 20 years earlier. So that that wasn't Crusher's fault. But noticeably, yeah, he, he had that, what we all have to deal with, mm -hmm. you get older. Yeah. Uh, what do you got? Your next one, George, I, I feel is fascinating because last week I talked about the picture that we had. It, it just This individual scared, It would he would scare me if I was a kid and I was looking at, but yet he went on your heels and, and there are a few select that make both of them. But this next one I think is pretty interesting. Well, I did this on purpose last week. I told you that one of the greatest heels was the wild bull of the Pampas Pampero Furpo. And I, the picture I showed you, he had the big bushy hairy head and he was in some ominous pose. And now today you see him here much more subdued. His hair is tamed down and, he became a baby face in a battle against Dr. X when they had a, a miscommunication during some matches. And the Furpo, you know, Furpo situation is, is that a lot of the best heels made great baby faces. And when he became a baby face, it was right around 1970. We had what we called hippies, the college set with the longer hair. And Furpo became a hero of the college set during that uh, year or two run, but very popular when he teamed with the Crusher. That was an alliance mm -hmm. right away. It fits right in. And the Crusher had forgiven Furple for all his sins against him. And they became a, a good team against the Vashans. Mm -hmm. 
So very popular. Why, and you guys can both speak to this here. Why are there guys that can be on both lists? Like why do sometimes the biggest heels make the best baby faces or vice versa? I mean, is there, is there just something that they can do? They can flip that switch to so extreme to get over both ways. Uh, go ahead and go Mick. Yeah. A, a lot of wrestlers could do that. And I think pretty much, well, 90% of the heels in the AWA at the end of their career turn baby face, you know, whether it's crusher or, or bruiser, mad dog, Vashon, Jerry Blackwell, Nick Bockwinkle. I think it's a longevity thing. I think the fans just get used to these guys. They're here for 10, 15, 20 years. They become part of your family on a Sunday morning in front of So the- is, is that a respect thing? Do they, they just Absolutely. get around to respecting them? Absolutely. And, and I, you know, it, they, they grow on them and, and, and also they've established themselves as, as such a tough guy and such a star that they can make that switch. They can, they can immediately go from heel to baby face and the fans accept it. Like, yeah, this guy's the real deal. I think the longevity thing and the familiarity is, is the most. I think you also have to throw in there the storyline aspect of it. Yeah. It's always interesting. We just talked about Furpo. The Crusher needed a partner against the Vashon brothers. And he said the bruiser was busy, couldn't get a hold of bruiser, and he was going to surprise the fans and get somebody as rough as the Vashon brothers. Well, out of nowhere, he comes up with Furpo. Now, Furpo and Crusher had had Donnie Brooks for several years against each other, but it's that mutual admiration that they have Mm -hmm. to go against two guys that they hate more than each other, or so they tell you. And they... The fans rally behind them. And then Furpo is doing what uh, other guys couldn't do against the Vashans, and that is match them in their roughness. And that's where that love of him. But Mick is right, though. It's the longevity thing, too. You come to respect them for what they do. All right, uh, Mick, let's get to your next one. And, I mean, obviously, I... Oh, what a shock. Sorry. What a shock this is going to be. If, if we could get him up on the screen, and, you know, and in the scheme of things, again, in terms of longevity, this guy was in the AWA for just a few years, but they were the biggest box office years in the history of the AWA. And, you know, it's obviously it's Hulk Hogan. Hulk came into the AWA with the intent. The promoters wanted him to be a heel. He had Johnny Valiant as his mouthpiece and, it didn't work. Immediately, the fans were cheering Hogan. You know, the Rocky Three movie had come out at the same time. I think Hulk Hogan, it, it, in terms of all-time attractions in the AWA, if you don't say Hulk Hogan, mm-hmm. you're really not being fair. And those of us who are old school can say, ah, you know what? But the reality is this guy was filling the St. Paul Civic Center every single month until he left the territory. Now, question, would the AWA have survived had they put the title on Hulk Hogan? We talked about that. No, they would not. The, the, it, it was inevitable. But uh, you can't argue with success. There's only one Hulk Hogan. He's the recognizable figure for, for modern-day wrestling. Was he just so different from anything else that had come along? Is that why like the fans are like, this, th- this person is just so unique? I mean, because... It, if I think about everything that the AWA had before that, you had every shape, size, type of individual. What was it about Hogan that people loved him right from the get-go? I Go think, first back. of all, the Rocky movie had a lot to do with it. You know, it was a simultaneous popularity thing. Catch, catch the casual. Was, yeah, yeah, to the casual fan. And, and Hogan is a six-foot, eight-inch, 300-pound, bronzed, tanned beach guy, you know, guitar player from Florida, and the AWA really did not have anybody like that on top before. Mm. The timing was right. The eras were changing in wrestling, and it was a whole different ball game. and Hogan was the absolute piece of the puzzle at the time. And I think we have to also go again with that, you know, you said the eras were changing. It goes back to that fan base again. By the time Hogan got here in the very early 80s, 
the, the old breed of wrestlers that had been around from the 50s, 60s, and 70s were now pushing their 50s, upper 50s, and age 60s. The 50s, 60s, and 70s were pushing the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Exactly. You know, and, and so there you had the Crushers and the Vern Gagnas and all those mm -hmm. people before that. And now there's this new breed and a younger fan. Yeah. The, the fan base, they were 11, 12, 13, 14-year-old kids, and Hogan was God. Mm -hmm. Whereas us guys that had been following it, we're now in our 30s, and we're seeing the end of our era. Yeah. It was a clashing of, it was like two storms coming together. And Hogan deserved the popularity he got, but it was a new breed of fans. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I, again, I mean, that's kind of when I, you know, in my, you know, mid, you know, mid eighties is kind of really when I started, you know, watching and I was like, you know, 10 or 11. Uh, let's get to your next one here, George. Well, I'm going to go with another guy who was a, was a heel. He was on my list last week and that's Dr. X for three years as a heel. He was, Nobody could beat him. Nobody could touch him. Everyone wanted to see him beat. They wanted to see him unmasked. They, they hated him. When he left and was gone a year, he came back. There he is with promoter Eddie Williams. And this was declaring he's a good guy because he has a white mask on now, not the black one that he had worn previously. But he came back and he said that his young kid, his young son, got beat up at school for defending his dad and that his dad was a wrestler. And he said, I wanted to make my kid proud. And so I'm turning over a new leaf. And of course he had some battles with Larry Hennigan, Lars Anderson, mm -hmm. Ray Stevens, the familiar breaking his leg angle. And Doc for the next two years was right at the top of our baby face uh, parade. I mean, you, can you get any more? I'm going to do this for my kid. I, you know, I, I want to turn it over. I want to be an example. If there's one thing that you can be a baby face for, it's for setting an example for your kids. I mean, I, would you agree, George? And that's exactly what he did. He said, he come out and said that my son got beat up in school because he was defending me and I want him to defend me because I, I want him to be proud mm -hmm. of me. So I'm, I, he, he had to turn over a new leaf. What dad wouldn't do that for their kid, right? Yeah. That, I mean, that is like the ultimate turn and you can't, you can't, you can't hate on that. I mean, that's, that's incredible. I'm kind of surprised we don't see more of that, frankly. And it's so simple an angle when you think about it, but the simplest things can work. Yeah. Yep. It's something everybody can relate. Like all parents can relate to. I want to be a good example for my kid. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, what do you got for your next one, Nick? I couldn't separate these two. Uh, I had to put them together because I think in the AWA history books. Oh, I won't they, get this one wrong. They they will for Hogan was already two. You already had Hogan. Be in blind. Uh, I'm talking <laughs> about Greg Gagne and Jim Brunzel. The high another picture of Hogan. God, I'm an idiot. Uh, you know, individually they were great wrestlers. Putting them together was absolute genius and. Say what you will about Greg Gagne. Uh, this guy, he was over as a babyface. And, you know, between he and Brunzel, you know, you could talk about who was the most popular. But during their run, when they had the feuds with Adonis and Ventura and then the Sheiks, uh, they were absolute magic. And they were a tremendous tag team. That's the thing that people have to remember. It wasn't just because Greg was Vern's kid. This was a cohesive tag team that certainly rivaled the Rock and Roll Express, you know, as an example, and, and you know, the Midnight Rockers as an example. But Ryan and Brunzel were terrific, <laughs> absolutely terrific. Was there any blowback back in those days for, you know, Greg Gagne, oh, he's Vern Gagne's son, that's why he's getting this spot? Because I know today things get dissected, you know, so many different ways and broken down. Was there any sort of, of that talk going on that he only got that spot because of his last name, Nick? Absolutely. It, it was even worse back then because in today's era, there's a lot of wrestlers that have the physique that Greg Gagne did back then. It's a lighter division. You know, you don't have so many of these super heavyweights, but it was always the knock. He's too light. He's Vern's kid. He wouldn't get a push anywhere else. It was worse back then. Um, you know, and, and today you still get these pundits that, you know, nah, I'm telling you, Greg Gagne was a hell of a worker and Nick Bockwinkle would attest to it and Jim Brunzel would attest to it. And again, the two of them just meshed. The high flyers were absolutely cream of the crop. 
I always wondered what would have happened if Greg would have come into the business. And I've thought about this a lot. If he'd have come into the business using a different name, not being Greg Gagne. And I think with his ability and his, his great wrestling, he would have had a lot more fan support mm. than he got and deserved. But that rub with Vert, I mean, they could have kept it a secret. Billy Red Lions and Dr. X were brother-in-laws. And yeah, how would they have been able to keep that a secret, though? I mean, Vern was the promoter. and I mean, how, how could Trust you keep me, that they could have pulled it off. Well, yeah. I don't know if they could have pulled it off here, but I think Greg could have maybe gone to another territory oh, yeah. under a different name, and he definitely could have gotten away with it. But again, you know, think of all the guys that are, you know, are, are his weight. Right now, the Dolph Ziggler's yeah. of the world, but, you know. But back then, Greg was kind of like stuck out like a sore thumb. Yeah. Now, I just I think that's an interesting point, uh, George, that you bring up about um, you know keeping it a secret and everything. I just would there. Let's say hypothetically that he would have done it and, and they would have changed the name. Would there have been animosity, or you feel maybe blowback, and fans would have felt deceived if they would have found out down the road that wait a minute, this is actually Vern's son. Why did you guys put one over? You know, why did you guys lie about that? George, do you feel like there would have been some, some blowback if they would have? And I know we're just talking hypotheticals here. Yeah. I don't think any more so than like I mentioned, Lions and Dr. X being brother-in-laws, Stan Kowalski and Jack Daniels were brother-in-laws. Randy Savage wasn't acknowledging that he was a Poffo mm -hmm. when this all started. I mean, I, I, I think it would have been fine. It, yeah. Later on, they would go, oh, man, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. I, I just I just think that's very interesting. You know, Vern could have come out and, you know, saved him. That's my son. All of a sudden, you know, I mean, yeah, hindsight 2020 on that. Um, let's see. Where where are we at? See, I kind of lost, uh, lost track I think there. number six for George. Yeah, yeah. This is, uh, this is your George. And, yeah, this is also another guy that was on your list last week as well. Well, and it's interesting about this guy, um, Chris and Mick, because some of the best bad guys we know make the best good guys and vice versa. Larry Hennig, he started out as a young rookie, earned his oats, changed his style a little bit, got a little more rougher. Then he was uh, Big Red Hennig. Then he was Pretty Boy Hennig. And eventually he reverted to Larry the Axe Hennig. And it's that whole story of coming full circle where we've seen him beat everybody up and be so dominant. And then all of a sudden he did something that drew the fans to him. He came to the rescue of Greg Gagne and Jim Brunzel on TV in a match where they were being triple teamed by Heenan, Bockwinkel and Stevens. And his interview, he said, I have a young son who's going to be a pro wrestler. And I couldn't see these guys trying to end the careers of Greg and Jim, even though he had tried to end Greg's career. But it made a difference when he said, I have a young son who's going to be a wrestler. And he was an immediate favorite from there on the ax. There it goes back to that, that common denominator, the lowest common de denominator, the cheap pop. I've got a kid at home. And it worked for, you know, it worked for Larry Hennig as well. Hit the mic switch, Chris. Hang on a minute. No, I'm just messing with you. My my mic's unmuted. Um, what you got for your next one, Mick? Oh boy, oh boy. Million bucks a year they pay this guy. <laughs> here, here is a, a wrestler, to my knowledge, another guy that never wrestled heel. If he did, I don't know about it. Uh, one of the great technicians in wrestling and i'm talking about tito santana now tito came into the awa he was having some moderate success and then they put him in a program with Sheik adnan lkc where tito was allegedly making eyes at a member of adnan lkc's harem uh, or harem on television and the Sheik I think it's and and busted him open with a sword and from that point on Tito was a superstar, and I'm telling you something. I, there's very few guys in the business that you don't hear a negative word about. When you talk to anybody who's been around the business for a long time, 
they will all tell you what a, a hell of a guy Tito Santana is. And I had the opportunity to work, you know, underneath Tito and Sergeant Slaughter in the old AWF, a consummate gentleman. And, you know, even into the late 1990s, he was still putting it, putting it all out there and was still making appearances into the 2000s doing some independent shots. Uh, he's a, a school teacher, I believe, in, in Ohio. Um, can't say enough good things about him. And, and he really, he was one of the major players in the AWA back in the, you know, in, in that era in the early 80s and the consummate babyface. So when you're talking about Tito Santana, you're kind of talking about all these other guys, um, you know, the, these big baby faces. You said that when, you know, she got on LKC, you know, hit him with that sword, busted him open, and he was made. Is, is is that, do you need that aha moment for a lot of these baby faces to be made by one heel? Is that, is that kind of the, the switch that's flipped there, Mick? I don't know if it's by one heel, uh, but, but certainly there has to be a defining moment for a baby face. They bring a guy into a territory and they groom him and they put him out in front of the fans, you know, as, as they do. And hopefully he kind of grows on the fans and they, they, catch on to him real fast but there's always that defining moment there's there's some heel that attacks him there's somebody who says something despicable about despicable about him or his family so there is that moment where you go from here to here and uh it, it's pretty consistent in wrestling it's tried and true mm -hmm. yeah all right you uh, know, what, i think, I ahead, think with tito when the sheik attacked him with the sword you have to remember the common denominator was is that the Sheik was abusing his lady uh, friend in the ring and pushing her around, and Tito went to her rescue. And when he did that, that's mm -hmm. when the Sheik attacked him. And therefore, the fans were going to obviously cheer Tito because he'd come sure. to say, you know, who can you, who can you get mad at when they're going to run to the rescue of a lady? Yeah. It's a morality play, Chris, always has been. Yeah. I, again, f families and, you know, defending your family, defending the women. It's the, yeah, those seem to always, you, I mean, you guys are right. I see, I want to go back and see that now, George, based on what you were, you know, what you were saying. It's like, I want, I want to go back and I want to take a look at that. Cause that just, when you look at the clip, the mm -hmm. sheik is pushing the lady from his harem. Okay. He's pushing her and mishandling her and Tito interjects. And then he pushes and Tito interjects again. And then he's attacked for his noble actions. Oh, fantastic yeah i i want to go back see and this is great because you guys are alerting me to to clips and moments in time that i didn't even know so this is great for me and i'm sure there are other people the same you know people that are around my age that are like i gotta go check these things out so hopefully we're you know bringing some of the bringing some of the memories back and you know exposing some of the um older pieces that some of us have missed why the hell else are we here chris yeah you know, this is what this is what made wrestling pro wrestling back in that era so good because it was a story being unfolded about real life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Playing on emotions, whether you loved or hated, mm -hmm. and, and morality. It, and it really the storylines were all about that. Yeah. Uh what do you got for your next one here, George? You know, the next guy, now Mick just mentioned Santana that he didn't think he was ever a baby or never a heel. And I think my guy, Edward Carpentier falls into that category as well. Um, his entire career, he was in the babyface role, the Frenchman. He'd come out and play the very calm and collected, speak a little French to the, uh, the fans. And his actions in the ring were always very noble. Um, there he is, you know, probably about 1967 or so. Just absolutely the consummate good guy. And when he wrestled against fellow babyfaces, Usually, Carpentier could be the guy that maybe was the sentimental favorite. I'm not saying he was the greatest wrestler in the world, but he could draw people, and that was all that mattered. So absolutely deserves to be on the list of AWA's most popular. Uh, what do you got for your next one here, Mick? Surprise, surprise. I think I know this guy. Um, again, for so many years, for the first 14, 15 years, he was in the AWA. He was the consummate heel. But then when he turned babyface, uh, after a situation with Larry Zbysko, uh, Nick Bockwinkel. Uh, Nick became 
one of the premier baby faces towards the end of his wrestling career, uh, particularly 85, 86, and then, you know, 87 feuding with Kurt Hennig. But it, again, as I mentioned before, it was the longevity and the respect thing. People knew that Nick was a wrestler. They knew that he was class. So despite the fact that he called him humanoids and eight to five lifers for all those years, they still had that connection with him. And did, did, him he, did he ever use those terms after he turned or how did he address the fans in interviews then? He didn't. He didn't on television. He he would do it if there oh. were mentions or what. But mysteriously, that that came out. You know, it disappeared from Nick's vocabulary. But uh, you know, feuding with Stan Hansen and, and Sheik Adnan LKC and and you know, then Kurt Hennig at the end, the fans really took to Nick. And I think this was a case where they really wanted to do that all those years, but they couldn't. They just couldn't do it. They needed a reason to do it. And when Larry Zabisco, you know, hit him with some nunchucks and started the feud uh, back in the mid 1980s, that was the turnaround. And God bless Nick. Uh, you know, he had started his career as a babyface, not here, but when he came to the AWA, he of course started as a heel and then transformed into babyface. This guy that just get choked up. I miss that guy. Yeah, I could tell just by looking at you that that it it means. He means a lot to you guys. Yeah, and yeah. I know that there's just, there, there's not. I don't think there's enough that we could say about Nick Bockwinkle that you guys could tell stories for days and days and days. I was telling, I was telling Mick before we went on the air. If you look directly behind me, you see there's a photo that has uh, myself with Nick Bockwinkle and Jim Brunzel, Rick Renslow, the Hennigs, and the Sheik are all in the picture. But that was at Nick's. 60th birthday party and Mick and I were talking about how we were honored again because Nick told us we were the only fans mm -hmm. there but we earned the right to be there yeah yeah and and we were the only fans that says pretty, something pretty remarkable yeah. uh what, what do you got for your next one here George I picked out Red Bastine boy I'll tell you what here is a Minneapolis born Minneapolis bred guy who started out here just a scrawny kid, and he went on the road around the world, the country, big tag team wrestler, and he came back home to the Twin Cities in 1969. He was hooked up with fellow redhead Billy Red Lions. To this day, other than the high flyers, I don't think you could have a better babyface tag team and more cohesive in the way they work together and uh, extremely popular. He teamed with the Crusher, with Hercules Cortez, and fans just loved him. And his matches were always excitement. He was very uh, aerial moves, uh, just really one of the, and outside the ring. Oh. The, he, he wasn't fake. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the good guys in the business were the heels outside mm -hmm. personality wise. Red was just a gentleman. Um, I, I, you talk about missing somebody. I miss Red. Mm -hmm. Visited my house. We had beers on the deck. You know, I had a steak together on the grill and his phone calls. But in the ring, the fans poured around him because he was popular. Uh, what do you got for your next one here, Mick? One of the legends in the AWA that started out, of course, as a vicious, clawing, biting, scratching heel. And I'm not talking about Shire. I'm talking about the legendary Mad Dog Vashon. Now, of course, for the, for the first, look at that. You got a Mad Dog on the right, and you got you got a dog that looks like he got neutered on the left. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, what a combination that is. That one goes uh, back to, uh, to 1990. But Mad Dog Vashon, talk about a guy who made the transformation 180 degrees. I mean, for so many years, he was so hated. From the mid 1960s through the 70s, just despised. And when they turned Mad Dog, you know, and again, occasionally he would team up with the Crusher. He would team up with Vern Gagne. God, I feel they, like any, anybody that would team up with uh, Crusher just got that, you know, quote unquote, that, that baby face Rob, as they would say. Oh, yeah. And, and they would always go out looking for the guy that they hated the most and despised the most in the business. 
Crusher did it. Vern did it. And they always mm -hmm. managed to find the dog, you know, underneath the bar stool someplace. Or, you know, Crusher bought a, a ticket to Algeria and found him in a back alley eating garbage. I don't know where they found him. But Mad Dog Vachon was so beloved the last several years of his career. And his feud with Jerry Blackwell may have been at least top three or four all-time feuds uh, in the AWA. Everybody remembers Mad Dog Bill and the the pine box, uh, the coffin uh, for Mad Dog Vichon, uh, for uh, Jerry Blackwell, and of course the dog sadly uh, was hit in a hit and run accident mm -hmm. uh, and knocked into a ditch, laid there for several hours, and as a result lost his leg. And uh, very very sad ending. But I, outside the ring, another one of these guys, mm -hmm. like George was saying, a lot of the baby faces were. Big time heels when you got away from the ring. Mad Dog Vashad was an absolute pussycat. Just real quick, one time we're at Cauliflower Alley Club, and Mad Dog is, is going past me. He's in a wheelchair. Somebody's wheeling him, and he looks up at me, and he says, I have to go find a fire hydrant. So <laughs> the, dog, the dog had to take a leak. And uh, <laughs> Mad Dog Vashad was an absolute pussycat outside the ring. One of the greatest and toughest that ever lived. Goes back to that storyline, too, when uh, that what cemented the dog being a good guy permanently was when Vern Gagne, of all people, went to his mortal enemy, the dog, and begged him to be his partner against Ray Stevens and Pat Patterson, who Vern couldn't beat because of their dirty tactics so he got the dog and then you have that storyline for the fans can Vern trust the dog can the dog trust Vern will they turn on each other so there's that added yeah intensity to the match but they 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 were together and they won the tag team title yeah and, and that's another one of those storylines that's you know old as time uh what do you got for your next one here George you know I'm gonna go with I have to go with a guy who for about six, seven years before he came to the AWA, he was what was known basically as a journeyman wrestler. He wasn't really making any main event money. Yeah, he was in a few here and there, but he was in the middle of the cards, wasn't going anywhere. And when he come up with a gimmick, and Vern Gagne gave it to him, and that was the mighty Igor, Dick Garza. He comes into the territory as this non-wrestler, he wanted to become a wrestler. He's got this impressive build. He takes off his coat. There's his build. And he can't speak any English, so they hooked him up with Ivan Kol or Kelmakov. And Igor became so popular with his feats of strength. He'd hold back a Volkswagen or hold back a, a van with his feet against the wall from, you know, speeding. He'd break bricks over his head, uh, tugs of war. And just extremely popular and very childlike. We were still not really politically correct. He was playing, and in all fairness, he truth, he was playing this dumb Polish immigrant. And that's really the way they described him. But it got over with the fans because they loved him. And he was very childlike. He'd hand out little squeak toys to the kids and very, very, and he main evented the rest of his career. But in the AWA, nobody could be popular than Igor. It's it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to cheer against somebody who just feels like they're just so innocent, you know. Exactly. He, he was a former Mister Michigan, yes. actually, uh, Dick Garza, and you know, guys tried to do the same gimmick after him, like Ivan Putsky, but nobody did it better than than the mighty Igor. Yeah. All right, uh, we got about ten minutes here left, guys. Uh, you each have, I think, Mick. I think you've got uh, two more, two. and George, you've got one. So. Uh, yep. somebody that, uh, I, I know your next one, you brought up Tito Santana earlier. Here's somebody that a, a lot of us, when you talk about Tito Santana, there's another name that comes to mind, maybe not necessarily in the AW way, but, uh, I know that I, I was a fan of the next individual on, on your list. Talking about perhaps the most underrated AWA heavyweight champion of all time. And that's Rick Martell. Yes. Um, that's a shot that I actually took at Wrestle Rock in 1986 uh, at ringside. That's uh, Harley Race that Martell is uh, flying over the top rope doing the, the 
body body press on uh, Harley. Uh, Rick Martel, consummate baby face, good looking guy, French Canadian. Uh, you know, he had that that French accent, which may or may not have been a detriment to him actually in his in his interviews. Mm -hmm. uh, his feuds with Stan Hansen or his feud with Hansen matches with Nick Bockwinkel, stellar off the charts. When he went to New York and he did the model thing, it just didn't fit because mm -hmm. Rick Martel was a decent, nice guy. And he to this day at fan conventions, he is as fan friendly as anybody. Uh, great wrestler. Uh, he and Tito teamed up against the High Flyers, actually, here in, in the AWA area, babyface teams against each other. Oh, wow. Oh, God, they were stellar. They were absolutely great great matches and can't say enough about rick martell mm -hmm. never got the, the the just do i think he had yeah, coming i agree all right yeah I, I i agree and uh you each have one more i know uh george you've got one that he's somebody that we've mentioned on a couple of other shows and uh i know this is one that awa fans they've loved for several reasons well and i'm, I'm gonna mention george scrap iron Gadaski. you know he wasn't a big name as far as main eventers go he usually wasn't even in the middle of the card. If he was on the card, he was in the opener. And the key thing about George Gadaski, though, is that he was an accomplished wrestler. He was very good in the ring. You could tell he knew what he was doing. He didn't need other wrestlers to tell him how to work a match. And the fans loved him because in most cases, he was in against somebody who was always meaner and tougher. And they always rooted for him because they wanted him to win. And George the did underdog. get some wins. He was the, the true underdog and very, very popular with the fans and very uh, popular outside the ring. You could have a conversation with George Gadaski. A lot of times at spot shows when I'd go, he'd be putting up the ring. You could sit down and talk with him and he'd talk back with you. And just an all-around good guy who obviously has to be listed on a list of favorite baby faces in uh, AWA hey. wrestling. And I think that's a great point and something that people can respect is that you talk about spot shows for anybody that's put up a ring. That's not easy. And there are some people that, Hey, they feel like they are above putting up the ring or tearing down the ring. And to, to still do that, you, you tell me that. And I just, I appreciate that because that's a work ethic. And I think that's also something that people can relate to. Well, you know, I think the thing interesting about Kadaski was is that, as I said, he was an accomplished wrestler. Mm -hmm. And he could have had a bigger push if he'd have wanted to, but he chose the role he was in, and he was happy to run that truck hundreds of miles every night to some mm -hmm. small town in Nova Nowheresville and put up a ring. And he'd take it down and then head to the next town and then work TV and, and a match on the local mm -hmm. card as well. Just a nice guy, really. And uh, Mick, uh, I know your last one is, is something along the same lines. Yeah. Perfect segue. And uh, I'm honored to, to know this guy. And I think George feels the same way. Absolutely. Without a doubt, Sodbuster Kenny J, when you talk about the baby faces in the history of the AWA, everybody remembers Kenny J. Uh, Kenny, one of the few enhancement talents to actually get an award from Cauliflower Alley Club. He did it all. Uh, he wrestled for years and years. They built him out of uh, out of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, I don't think Kenny, you know, Kenny says I, you know, I might have flown over there one time. Uh, <laughs> but but I Kenny G, and they call him the Sodbuster because we talked about it before. He he legitimately was in the landscaping business. Kenny did everything. He wrestled every big name star that came through the AWA territory. People remember him for putting over Muhammad Ali back in the day in the 1970s on Wide World of Sports. I can't say enough good things about Kenny. You know, you, you talk about the carpenters, the guys that build the business and make the stars look good. But outside the ring, you would be hard pressed to find a nicer guy with a bigger heart than Sodbuster Kenny J. And and I know George will agree with this. Talk about a guy who's charitable. He is just the best. I, I love Kenny J. 
We got about uh, five minutes, a little less than five minutes here left, guys. Um, let's go ahead and give a trivia question, and uh, we'll set up the uh, shout outs and what's going on next week. So, uh, the trivia question here, Mick, is what? Trivia question in the history of the AWA, I want you to tell me of what significance was a man named Jack Horner. Not the guy in the corner, you know, sticking his thumb in, the, in a pie or whatever. But Jack Horner played a role in the history of the AWA. I think they call those ring rats. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, dear God. Now you're going to get the mail instead of Shire. But at any rate, uh, Jack Horner played a role of some significance in the AWA and Tell me what that is. Send me an email. You got 48 hours to do so. And I should remind people, if there's more than one winner, we toss them all in a hat. Mm -hmm. Pick one winner, and you'll get some wrestling memorabilia. Hopefully it's there. a different hat than that one that Marty pulled Andre's name out of. Oh. <laughs> well, okay. Well, we don't have time for the story, but now I'm very curious. Um, we got to about two minutes left here, guys. Uh, let's get some shout-outs here. And uh, go ahead. Let's uh, go ahead and uh, I got it on there. So Mick, why don't you, why don't you go ahead and do it first? My good buddy Dale Spear. Uh, Dale was uh, born and raised in the state of Maine, and then moved to the Twin Cities area. Lived here for a long, long time. Uh, he's a broadcast journalist, a huge wrestling fan, attends all the conventions. A former broadcast colleague of mine, mm -hmm. and uh, listens to the podcast religiously. Downtown Dale Spear, one hell of a guy. All right, uh, Georgie, go ahead. I've got a shout out to my buddy from Chicago, Rich Tito. Rich is the consummate wrestling fan. He's, he loves to collect old memorabilia and just an all around nice guy. And I've just been honored that we had a chance to meet some years back in person. He follows our podcast. He always has nice things to say about it. And just a good guy. And Rich, I love you, man. Thanks for being on board. And uh, mine's going to go to my friend, Matt Witwicky. Uh, I got a chance to, to really know him when I was in Sioux Falls. And, you know, big, uh, you know, big fan of the podcast. He's a uh, big in the uh, Division II football world. He's a big stat guy. So, uh, Matt, I appreciate it. And uh, just keep, keep supporting it. And, yeah, if you guys have any, uh, you know, feedback, hit us up on, you know, Twitter, AWA Unleashed. Hit uh, George or Mick up on Facebook. Um, rate, review, subscribe, do all of that. And before we get going, I think we got another Q&A on tap for next week, don't we? Uh, we do. And uh, those are very popular. So we urge people, send them to us, either Facebook, DM, or, you know, via email. Any questions you have about the history of the AWA, we're going to talk about it. I love talking about the old behind-the-scenes stuff mm -hmm. that uh, that fans are not familiar with. So hopefully we, we can do that next week. And uh, I wanted to say, Chris, real quick, I do have PayPal, so you don't have to send me the check. Just just PayPal. That, that'll that work. I'm sorry. What, you're, you're breaking up. What? I, you're, uh, you're, yeah. freezing, you're freezing up. Yeah. I can't. Mick, your, your mic is muted. Oh, wait. That's I did that. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Well, I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to go around to the bank and see if I can get you guys some money. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Thanks, everyone.